uh, that we are hosting here uh, within our business strategy decision making uh, components of the economics departments. Um, just to also uh, call out, Aaron mentioned there's a number of podcasts that are now available. So if, if you like what you hear here today, uh, there will be more opportunities to get more information, uh, embed yourself in, into the conversations uh, that, that are happening on the ground, in industry, with alum, uh, and, and, and really to, to really engage our, our, our network. Uh, speaking of which, after our panelists uh, discuss uh, their background and, and their experience, uh, we will have an opportunity for questions and, and answers. So, so please be thinking um, throughout what what you would like to, to, to dig a little bit more into, um, and then immediately following, we will. Uh, I encourage we encourage all of you to stick around and, and, and mingle uh, over some small uh, dishes and, and uh, some some drinks, uh, so that uh, we can continue this conversation uh, beyond this room and, and into the world. So. Uh, Aaron mentioned tonight's really special because of the topic on hand. Uh, we're, we're looking at the strategies in consulting. Uh, there's there's a, a lot of, of interest and, and perhaps some even demystifying of, of what consulting is and what opportunities are there. And what our panelists provide us tonight is a wide range of consulting types, anywhere from human resources to antitrust to the strategy and operations and, and organizations and leadership. And, and I, I hope that uh, to be able to, to hear the differences and, and see the similarities and, and to identify uh, if, you, if you're interested in, in thinking through what a career in, in consulting may, may look like. And I see a number of my students in the room, so I, I know this is top of mind for, for a number of us, uh, to think about how their paths may be traditional, untraditional, but still get to a point where, where everyone wants to be. So uh, without further uh, ado, let me briefly introduce our panelists, allow them an opportunity to come uh, and talk individually or as a group. Um, and so uh, from your right to left, uh, tonight we have Christy Niskoff from Vista Consulting. So great for you to be here, thank you. Um, and then we have Kate Moberg from uh, Berkeley Research Group. And then we have Admira Abisevich from uh, Illumina Consulting uh, with also uh, Sanal um, Kosick from Illumina Consulting as well. And then Matt Del Santo of Winston and Strong. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'd like to first introduce uh, Matt up to the stage uh, to talk about <clears throat> strategies and consulting. Sure. Happy to do so. So, first, before we get started, before I tell you a little bit about myself and, and what I do, I'm curious the composition of this room. So, I, I have an idea, but how many are MBA or graduate students in this room? Okay, and how many are undergraduate? Okay, and how many are econ or applied econ majors or have that ex background experience? Okay, just curious. So my name is uh, Matt Del Santo. Um, I am an attorney actually at uh, Winston and Strawn. It's a firm here in Chicago, a uh, very large law firm with offices around the world. Um, I uh, went to law school at the University of California, Berkeley. Before that, I got, oh, we have a Berkeley? Yeah, 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 yeah I love Berkeley. It's a wonderful and very unique place in many respects. Um, I highly encourage spending some time there. Uh, and before that, I got my master's in economics and PhD in applied economics from the University of Minnesota. So for a long time, I've had an interest in the intersection of law and economics. Um, which has developed into my practice, which is a traditional legal practice, but also has large consulting components, which is why I'm here uh, to speak with you today. So um, so what do I do? So it, my firm, uh, in terms of how I actually consult, uh, I a few, probably like four or five years ago, 
I started a group within Winston Strong called Law and Empirical Analysis Group. And what I did was I hired actually a couple of master's level economists um, who uh, were actually, unfortunately, they were, they were not from DePaul. I will consider that in the future, but at the time, they're actually University of Illinois grads and, and one from NYU. And what I did was the practice of the law, specifically antitrust in which I practice, has a very strong quantitative component and it's, uh, it's heavily quant quantitative. You work a lot with economics, uh, economic PhDs, professors around the country who offer expert testimony, and I needed some assistance in-house because as the economist, as a lawyer, I was getting all sorts of questions, and they were largely strategic and consulting in nature, such as what is potential exposure liability that we face in this particular matter? How do we how do we look at what the cost of continued litigation would be versus trying to actually settle something now? So I started this group and it's become successful and we've continued to grow uh, and uh, my practice continues. So what do exactly do I do? Well, a few things. Um, like I said, I am actually a lawyer and an economist, so we're both hats. Um, my team and I, in uh, a lot of ways, we will assist with strategic decisions at the beginning of a litigation. Litigation is, for those of you who may not know, is a, a term just for filing a lawsuit, right? So you file a lawsuit. So whether we're defending or the, uh, the lawsuit or plaintiffs bringing the lawsuit, my team and I get in early, try to figure out economically what are the best possible strategies that we can put forth for our clients, whether we're trying to defend or trying to actually go out and assert a claim. And we do that from an economic standpoint. Again, an antitrust, um, it's, it's for those of you who have had some sort of industrial organization or otherwise, um, uh, some type of a background in antitrust, um, typically you're trying to figure out what are the best economic facts you can possibly put forth um, to support your particular role. So start litigation, defend litigation, um, and what else do we do? We also do what I would say is a cost-benefit analysis. So litigation can cost quite a bit of money. Um, we, if you, uh, for, for particular uh, clients, it can run in the millions of dollars a year, sometimes even in a given month for um, a big uh, a company to use a firm like ours or others to try to defend against a claim or to try to go after. So what we try to do is help clients determine what is the best course of action, what is economically rational or what is the best possible efficient from their standpoint in terms of their decision-making processes, how best to go about and do it. Um, so it's essentially a, a form of a cost-benefit analysis in some sense. Um, in the other uh, components that I would say I do beyond that, where I'm really trying to help develop claims strategically, defend against claims brought by others, or assessing where we are in litigation is, we work with outside economics experts who are the ones who will provide testimony and other uh, evidence in support of our case or against our case. Um, I'm not gonna get too much into the, the, the technicalities of it, but when you bring a lawsuit, Typically in a large case, you work with outside economic experts. And so my team and I regularly interface with those economic experts. We develop a strategy of what is going to go into their economic report that they're gonna draft, how they're going to address certain issues throughout. And so we, we do that early on. And I noticed we have some someone from BRP. I was just on the phone the other day interviewing uh, her firm for one of um, uh, a potential uh, retention. Um, obviously, Berkeley Research Group is a very well-renowned uh, economic consulting firm that uh, we regularly work with. So, um, I think one of the, the other things that I was asked to like, give an overview on is how do we formulate the, the strategic advice that we give our actual clients or, or that I give to other attorneys in the firm? Well, one of the reasons I asked at the beginning how many economic majors there are and, and who's been through it is, I guess for those who are into economics or taking courses, you probably remember, remember an intermediate micro, hopefully you remember, and hopefully I'm not so dated that somehow this has changed, that, uh, that you, in terms of when you're selling a household problem or a consumer problem, what is the consumer or the household trying to do? Maximize utility. Maximize utility, right. Maximize utility. You have some overall objective that shows preferences. You're trying to maximize utility and you're doing it subject to what? Budget, budget constraints. Budget, rather resource constraints. So 
how do I, I think about what we do in a lot of ways and how do I formulate strategic advice and why does this matter? Well, a lot of times, whether it's with legal claims within the firm, working with people outside, or even doing internal projects within the firm, the first question I ask is, what is the overall objective? What is the objective you're trying to get out of whatever you're asking me to do? Because oftentimes there isn't a clearly defined objective. And without a clearly defined objective, trying to offer advice is very difficult, right? Um, as some of you who are maybe more mathematical, trying to maximize two different uh, functions subject to the same constraints, uh, you realize that there are some mathematical problems and uh, uh, that's just not quite possible. So you have to have a well-defined objective up front. So one of the first things we do is try to define what is the well-defined objective that we're going to actually try to address. The second, when we're formulating strategic advice is, what are the actual constraints that are on it? What are the resources that are available? Again, if it's a legal type decision where we're trying to go out and uh, assist with bringing a claim, what are the budget constraints for the matter? What are the resource constraints for the matter? What is actually available? And how do we do that? So I personally, again, probably because I am an economist, think of it very much as a maximization problem subject to constraints. And that's how I think through actual matters to try to come up with what I think is the optimal strategy. Um, and I would also say too, that one of the things that we do typically is, um, it is focus on who our audience is. So in various matters, so when we're talking with and developing strategies for litigation or otherwise, you gotta know who your audience is. When we're talking to other economists and going through and working with the experts, I can speak about regression analysis, I can go through, I can talk in that language without concern that what I'm saying and that strategy is going to be lost in the terminology. You go into a group of lawyers who have no quantitative background whatsoever, Talking about that is to an audience that's going to go in one ear and out the other. So you have to be able to take what you know on a technical standpoint from your training, I'm assuming that you're getting here and, and developing here, and being able to put that into terms in which your audience actually understands. And so, um, because if you don't, again, it's not actually going to, to resonate. You're not gonna be able to make your point. So, you know, one thing I would say is, again, because you're all students, um, not that you probably wanna hear advice uh, from me on this, but I would say, take the time when you're going through in your economics courses and otherwise, and you're learning the concepts, to take a step back and be able to make sure that you can take what you learn and explain it to somebody in a form who's not, who's not familiar with the subject matter at hand, whether that be economic analysis, strategy, et cetera. And that's largely what I do too, is I joke on my days when I'm being incredibly cynical that I uh, do nothing more than do percentage change and explain percentage change to attorneys who all hated math. And, uh, <laughs> and that is what I do is, is, is calculate percentage change. That's obviously not really what I do all day long, but again, you have to be able to take whatever concept and whatever strategy you're developing and be able to put it into a context that your audience understands. And then the last thing in terms of typically what I do, um, and uh, I uh, already touched on this to a large degree, but in terms of litigation, again, you know, I would say I consult uh, with other attorneys in the firm on how best to achieve our clients' objectives. Um, I also work, you know, just in terms of representing clients in, uh, in actual litigation and otherwise, um, you know, litigation or actually out, you know, in, in pending litigation. But, you know, one of the things we, we regularly do is, again, at the end of the day, we take it back, we evaluate the risk um, of taking certain legal decisions, whether to pursue litigation, whether to pursue a claim, what is involved, um, and we take that against what they expected, that, that cost against what they expect the benefit is. And then again, we translate that into something that a client can understand. You could be very quantitatively sophisticated and be able to do all sorts of wonderful analyses, et cetera, but if your client, at the end of the day, isn't able to understand it, it's not really of much benefit to them. Um, again, to know your audience. So that's kind of an overview of what I do. It is a unique law practice. It's not typically done, um, but I do find it to be exciting because it blends economics, law, and trying to come up with what is the best, most strategic considerations. So am I, am I within my 10 minutes, I think, or right around there? That's absolutely okay. right. So great, thanks so much. Next group, we'll invite uh, Sam and Andrew uh, Bolt to come up. 
and get you set up. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. My voice carries. So I don't think I'll use the mic. So, um, let's see if this is set up. <laughs> Maybe a function update. Yeah, it comes with that. There we go. There you go. Okay. So uh, what what we wanted to do today is, is follow strict directions that we received coming into into okay. this discussion. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about our background, uh, kind of the, the past, maybe the, the present, and 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 the future elements of where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. Uh, so maybe from a from a background point of view, uh, undergrad at Michigan State, uh, right in East Lansing, Michigan. Anybody from Michigan here? There we go. Mm -hmm. Thank you for doing that for me. So uh, yeah, Michigan State undergrad, um, you know, right out of Michigan State, went into industry rather than consulting. So so I took a bit of an untraditional path in, in terms of building up my my career. Um, went into uh, Danaher uh, supply chain in their uh, in their procurement uh, and, and a little bit in, in their manufacturing functions. Moved all over the country uh, with them. Uh, from there, went to Avon on the back end of supply chain into into distribution, uh, and and uh, sort of as I finished that assignment, I had the itch to go to grad school. So I ended up going to Ohio State, stayed within the Big Ten family, if you will, and um, you know, focus there was was general management, uh, clearly an MBA, and uh, lens on strategy as well. So this topic is very much near and dear to me, and we're actually living some of those lessons in in the business that we're running today. Uh, out of Ohio State, I went to Ernst & Young, uh, spent a couple of years uh, with their supply chain consulting practice, uh, transitioned back into industry, and then now back into consulting. So if I think about maybe the work that, that I've done over the course of time, yes, there's been you know, uh, planning, sourcing, manufacturing, delivery, uh, very different. You had the common thread throughout all of those was the people side of the equation. Right, that's that's the common thread across all of them, and that's really what drove a lot of the offerings we're going to share with you today, and uh, maybe some of the examples that, that we want to show you in some visuals in true consulting fashion with slides, uh, so we can kind of bring it to life. So, Admira, if you want to talk a little bit about you. Yes, hi everyone, Admira Bishevich, managing partner with Illumia. I graduated from DePaul with my MBA last summer. Um, thank you, <laughs> thank you. I, I'm sure you're all itching to get out of here with your with your uh, degree, and it'll fly by. Um, so I also had a bit of a non-traditional path. Um, I did a lot of different things. I was fortunate enough to have a leader and mentor who believed that talent was more important than experience, and so. Uh, customer service, uh, managing account managers, starting an organizational development team, taking over recruiting, uh, starting new business units, product launches, just a variety of things that I had to learn very quickly. And similar to Sanal, what I noticed in all of those ventures is that it's the people that mattered. And that leadership, if you have good leadership skills, it doesn't matter what you're leading, right? You can learn the technical side. It's the leadership and management side that's a lot more difficult to find and develop. There are many Gallup and other studies that show that about one in 10 people is a good manager, right? So um, that's where my love for the people side of the business really came from and why I chose to focus on it now as a consultant. Um, you know, when I ran organizational development, I was within an organization that hired a consulting firm, and so I got to first see it as a client. And from that, you also learn a lot, right? You learn what mattered, what didn't, what stuck with you, what's important. And one of the things that, um, if I can leave you with one thing, it's to be a trusted advisor, right? So when you're within an organization, you, are part of that organization and you really care about the outcome and you have to take that same mentality with you when you're a consultant. It can't be about just selling. It can't be about forcing solutions down people's throats. It has to be about what's now best for your client the same way you viewed it when it was best for you and your organization. And so what we'd like to do now is just walk you through a couple of examples of how this really all comes to life when we work with different organizations on these topics. 
Okay, so let me maybe just give a couple highlights on the overall uh, page here and maybe some of the work that we do. So, so to, to, the way to read this page is maybe starting at the top and then working our way down this way and then down this way. So way at the top, we typically start with psychometric based talent selection. So let's say some of your companies are hiring people, right, to, to bring them in. We'll typically put them through assessments to help make the hiring decision. That's maybe, maybe one. Two is focus on uh, high performance teams. So let's say we'll go into a manufacturing site and we'll spend time with the team there in order to create a high performing organization, right? While anchoring in the five behaviors that are listed up here. We did a lot of disc work, so personality assessments, uh, culture transformation, which is the example that we're gonna share with you today, uh, maybe in, in a bit more detail, leadership development programs, and we also do quite a bit of one-on-one -on -one development. So, so really executive development end to end, okay? So the first example that we have up here, ignore the, the eye chart for a minute, I'll, I'll explain it. Uh, but uh, what I wanna do is just kind of set the context. So this was a $600 million uh, industrial manufacturer within the chemical sector uh, that has gone through a rather difficult period, a lot of layoffs, uh, a lot of jobs moved to, to India, to China, to Mexico, uh, for, for good reasons, right? In order to, to realign the strategy where they wanted to go as an organization, okay? The challenge was when they did that, uh, there was a residual lack of trust in the people that remained, right? All the people that left, that was very difficult. But then there's a challenge for those that remain, kind of what, is it, what does it mean for me? What does it mean for my family? What does it mean for my kids, right? So a lot of raw emotion that, that tends to permeate throughout the organization. So our work there was to really go in and help them transform the culture so they can continue to thrive well into the future after all these changes were made. Okay, so very, very, very difficult task. So, uh, in terms of the approach and how do we typically do this? So uh, generally we'll go in and, and initiate an current state evaluation. So whether that means first meeting with the executive team, understanding sort of their point of view on the organization, what's going well, what do we need to change, what do we need to stop doing, right? Uh, we may run a culture assessment, uh, so some sort of a validated a research instrument that allows us to get an objective point of view around what's happening, right? So kind of anonymous, getting a pulse for, for the organization. As we're doing all of this, we're, we're forming preliminary hypotheses. We're thinking about leading practices. You know, we're, we're here in a silo mentality. Tomorrow, we need to operate as one team. What's the gap within that? What are the behaviors and how do we begin to drive those, right? We then begin to build our case for change, right? So it's not just about the leadership team. We need to make sure that the case for change is very compelling so that when we engage, the 2,200 people globally, they can understand why we need to shift gears, why we need to take the time to appreciate the other people left, but that those of us that are here, we're still here and we have to move the organization forward, okay? And uh, so once we do all of that, we'll spend time devising the culture of vision. And lastly, MHB stands for Mindsets, Habits, and Behaviors. So that's really spending time in teaching the organization a lot of these uh, EQ-centered tools. So really getting into self-awareness, self-control, awareness of others, building relationships, understanding organizational dynamics, um, productive conflict. Uh, one very interesting uh, notion here was that yes, there was the organizational culture, but there was also the country culture and the impact on org culture. In other words, you know, take, take India and, and Mexico and how leadership is viewed versus North America. And how do you begin to sort of morph this into gelling as, as one team, okay? So once we did all this, we, we call this, you know, set the stage right at the bottom here. We then initiate the drumbeat, okay? So you'll notice that we have the leadership team here first. So we'll, we'll typically put them through our sessions in order to ensure that they can internalize the concepts and quote unquote, begin to walk to talk in terms of the new mindsets, habits, and behaviors. For those of you that have direct reports, whether you want to believe it or not, whether you want to acknowledge it or not, your people watch your every single move, tone of voice, speed, inflection, what you do and what you don't do, right? So those are some of the lessons we typically try to impart on them as they leave the, the sessions that we have. Once they're done, we'll then deliberately behind the scenes begin to pick the next layer down. That's typically the mid-level management. Uh, those folks are typically the most in the most difficult position because they're getting pressure from the top and they're getting pressure from their team. So they're kind of sandwiched, right? So we spend quite a bit of time with them, teaching them these, these EQ capabilities to be able to, to navigate the new environment. Once we're done with them, we will then selectively pick influencers within the organization 
both positive influencers and those that maybe may not have been as positive over the course of time. Premise being, if we can convert them into the new way of living and working and operating and being, their impact tends to be amplified. Okay, so the last step here is as we work to the leadership team and level management, influencers will select a group of change agents that will go through deep immersion. So then these people become responsible for sustaining the transformation long after we're gone. Okay, one of the benefits that, that the two of us have is that we both bought consulting services uh, within industry and we've sold consulting services, right? So typically the notion is once you hire a consultant, they rarely leave, right? They'll always find something to, to do, right? So when you talk about strategy, uh, one of the things that we try to do as a differentiator and as a message to our clients is that, look, our job isn't to stay here. Our job is to help you fix the problem, facilitate knowledge transfer, step back, and operate as a, as a trusted advisor. That's the, the overall message that, that has resonated relatively well with the firms that we typically engage with. Okay, so th there's a second example here that Mary's gonna walk us through. This one is a team development example. So an organization about 1,400 people and the CEO is retiring at the end of the year. So what they'll typically look for is how do we leave the organization in a good place for the new person, by the way, we don't know who it is yet because we don't have a succession plan. Well, there's an issue. Uh, how do we get ready for when somebody else takes over in a year? And by the way, senior leadership team, super dysfunctional, right? And HR is the one pushing it. Senior leadership is not admitting it. And there it's HR really working with the CEO to get them to the point of admitting one, they need help and then being willing to get that help. And uh, there were a couple things that were important for this client. They wanted someone that could help with the entire life cycle so that um, once the new, uh, once the team development portion is done, the new CEO comes in, there will likely be some culture shifts that the same consultant can do that work as well, right? So within consulting, you have some people who really focus on one thing. Like I, we have some people we work with, they just do DISC. Right, and that's really great in some aspects because you're really the expert. In other examples, a company is really looking for a holistic solution and somebody that can help them with different aspects of the organization. And so um, we are working with the senior leadership team in a one-year program on utilizing, I'm not, how many of you are familiar with Patrick Lencioni's uh, Five Behaviors of a Dysfunctional Team book? Yes, yes, highly recommended. Um, really favored by a lot of uh, C-suite executives and managers. Uh, it's a fable, really easy read, but it follows this model here, which is what we use for the assessment and objective assessment of the team. So it starts with trust at the base. If you don't have trust, you don't have anything else. Morphs into productive conflict, getting everyone's commitment and buy-in, having everyone drive accountability on the team, ultimately driving results. And um, so that's a, a one-year project. And then again, they are looking, we're hoping to not leave for a while. Um, they're looking for further work in the future. So really depending on what your organization offers and how you can tailor it to the company while driving self-sufficiency and continuing to help them in new ways that they need is ideally how you, how you position it. Well, just one other comment in terms of differentiators here. So when you think about HR engaging with a, a very senior leadership team, but there are a lot of egos in the room that you have to deal with, right? So part of our job is to help depersonalize the discussion and bring an objective point of view that's anchored in leading practices. I Meaning this is not personal. This is what your peers in the industry are doing, right? And that then begins to serve as a lever for them to say, okay, maybe we need a little bit of help, right? So. As long as you can get them to admit and begin, uh, the transformation sort of tends to take a life on, on itself. So this next slide um, is gonna be an eye chart. I'm gonna forewarn you, so I'm gonna kind of walk you through, through what, what's the best way to, to look at it. So because the premise today is consulting, this is our one-on-one -on -one work. So one-on-one -on -one consulting, if you will, career development. I wanna talk about it through the lens of developing a consultant. So what does a high-performing high consultant look like to our lens. So kind of as, as you're you know, thinking about this framework, you can also present it, you know, if you're a marketing person, if you're a supply chain person, if you're an HR person, the framework still applies, 
but I'll talk about the consulting side doing that's the, the topic today. So here's how to read this page. Right in the middle, there's a triangle, okay? The triangle represents your career, and the box around the triangle represents a supporting pillar. So I'm gonna talk about the, the triangle today, so, so your career. The premise is that every single one of us has three pillars uh, that, that drive our career. Number one are technical capabilities. So as a consultant, right, what is your fastball? What is it that you're very good at? Are you a tremendously strong marketing consultant? Are you a supply chain person? Are you a procurement person? Are you a strategy person, right? And if so, if I was to pick up the phone in the middle of the night and call you and ask you, what are the performance drivers in your field? Could you rattle them off? Yes or no? It's typically a binary answer, right? Uh, on the IT side, right, an example here could be, Yes, you may have your technical know-how in terms of traditional on-premise systems, but do you understand machine learning, artificial intelligence, robotic cross automation, all the new trends? And if not, let's begin to position you to be able to support your clients in that way. So really building that, that technical pillar first, okay? In parallel, as a consultant, you're dealing with a lot of different competing factions, if you will. Whether it's the internal partner that you're reporting up to, right? Who wants the margin, who wants the sale, who wants the growth? Whether it's keeping your client happy, sometimes you have to answer why it's sky blue and you have to figure out how to navigate these, these topics, right? Sometimes it's leading a team uh, that's dispersed globally, right? So spending time on the second pillar, which is the human side of the equation, right? So again, self-control, awareness, uh, self-awareness, self-control, awareness of others, building relationships, managing the client relationship, making them look good. That's part of, of the job as well, through the leading practices that you're bringing in. And then lastly, a V to E up here stands for vision to execution. So this really means, are you able to conceptualize an idea and bring it all the way home, right? That could mean taking a traditional on-premise system and bringing it up into the cloud. What does the future state organization look like? What are the functions like? What are the responsibilities like? What upskilling do you need to do in order to make these guys operate in the future, right? So it's, it's sort of a, a blend of, of these different elements. The box around the pyramid is where I find, and me included, I'll maybe just speak for me, is where, where I tend to struggle sometimes, which is that sense of balance, right? So if you're in the big four, right, whether, whether it's Ernst & Young, whether it's PwC, whether it's Accenture, you're generally on the road 80% of the time. Okay, that could be very taxing on you personally, on your family life, on your well-being. So what we like to do is just ensure that there's a sense of balance in terms of mind, body, spirit, in terms of family, in terms of civic responsibility and social with a primary focus on career trajectory. Okay, so those are the couple of pages that we've had. Again, broad-based organization, culture transformation, high-performance teams, and then one-on-one. -on -one. So our hope is that you know, as we get the questions, you can kind of begin to decouple some of these. Okay. Good? All right. Thank you. I'd like to invite uh, Keith up to talk about what he's Lucky you guys, you're getting a double dose of litigation consultant. <laughs> Very exciting. So Matt stole a lot of my thunder, uh, but I can tell you a little bit more about, sorry. Sorry. You did. Um, but so I can tell you guys a little bit more about what BRG specifically does. Um, so I guess the first thing is Berkeley Research Group. Um, we were founded by an economist, so primarily economic consulting. Um, I would say the bread and butter of BRG is litigation consulting. Um, we also have management consulting, other strategic consulting outside of litigation and disputes, but I think you know most of the experts, and I'll tell you guys a little bit more about experts in a second, um, at BRG are doing dispute work, and that's I think what BRG is really known for and the space that we're operating in. Um, before I go down that rabbit hole, uh, I'm Kate Hilbert. <laughs> um, I'm an associate director of BRG. Um, I'm a double demon from the <laughs> So I got my last degree um, in 2013, and I've been at BRG while I was there, um, and have been there somewhat since then, um, with a short two-year stint doing operations consulting at FTI, so I can kind of talk about that. 
to um, another uh, litigation focus firm. Um, so at BRG, there's kind of two ways to be an expert. Um, and if you were to go to our website, you guys would see that expert services are really kind of what we're highlighting there. Um, so I think the way that I think about being an expert, there's you can either be a testifying expert. So in a litigation dispute, you would actually, you know, put your right hand on the Bible and and um, and give your expert testimony. Um, you can also be more of a consulting expert, um, and that maybe would be more of a privileged position. So if you're if we're working with attorneys, one of the strategies that the law firm that we're working with or the end client that we're working with would want to think about is, you know, is is our problem here big enough or our dispute here big enough that we want to engage both a testifying expert and a privileged expert. And the um, the strategy there is maybe we don't want our testifying expert to see all the documents that the privileged expert can see. Um, and we want strategy advice on our case from the, um, the consulting or the privileged expert. And then we want to it, it's a it's a litigation strategy, right? We want to feed our our um, testifying expert certain documents, or basically give them deniability um, for any kind of wishy-washy areas that we don't necessarily want them to dig into um, on the stand, right? Um, no, no comment. Not at all. Um, so the, the great thing about being an expert and expert services when you're testifying, um, I think that. The biggest thing that I've taken from my 10 years in the industry is that the best thing for an expert is to truly believe what they're saying and to, at, on some level, you're an advocate because these people are your clients and the law firm, you know, you kind of want to give your clients what they want. At the same time, it's always better for you in your career if you truly believe what you're saying. Um, and then, so if I testify on a case five years before, uh, and I say one thing, and then I have another, you know, I have another case later, and they, the attorneys want me to say something else, I would turn that case down. Um, because it actually, your, your word, um, and in these matters, they will go back and look at what you said before, right? Um, and they'll say, oh, you know, um, my boss is named Kevin O'Brien, and so we always talk about um, Mr. O'Brien, you said this five years ago in your testimony. Do you still believe that? And why are you not saying that on this case? And luckily, he, you know, he's really strong in his convictions and that he's never going to say something he doesn't truly believe on a case. Um, so that's, you know, so some in some ways you're straddling the line of being an advocate for your client um, and being an independent expert. And you always want to default to independent expert um, in litigation consulting. Uh, so to bring it all the way back to where I would have needed it to be as an undergraduate um, when I was first uh, looking to, to join BRG and they came and they were talking about cases and matters and expert testimony, um, you guys have probably, you've got this already, but um, if you think about CSI um, and your legal shows, right, and they'll, they'll put up a ballistics expert, right? So BRG ha is full of lots of experts like that, except they are mostly opining on much less interesting things than ballistics, such as <laughs> accounting. Um, we have basically we have industries um, specialties like healthcare or construction or you know pretty much any industry under the sun, and you could also be more of a technical expert in something like in accounting or antitrust or really any other area like that. Um, and so you can really go both ways. Um, I'm mostly a healthcare, um, a healthcare person, not more of a consulting expert, not quite there with the resume to be a testifying expert yet. Um, my boss is, uh, he testifies on all kinds of cases and one of the most important things is for him to be able to go up on the stand and say, based on my 30 years of experience doing this thing, um, I can say the following about the healthcare industry or I can say the following about accounting. Um, so I'm mostly in the consulting or privileged expert role a lot of the times, um, and and the way that we'll set that up on on our you know on our back end, we'll have two matters. Um, I'll be the you know the privileged expert, and I'll get all the documents, um, and then look through them and say, okay, I think we should provide these ones to Kevin, um, and then he'll get fed um, those documents to do his um, his testifying expert work. Um, 
And a lot, a lot of the work that we do on our team, and Brent is on our team, by the way, if you guys have questions, um, from the staff level perspective, we do a lot of data work, uh, a lot of healthcare technical, um, technical work. So there's, there's a lot of strategy in thinking about how, how can we make this analysis you know, really speak to a jury, or you know, depending on your audience, how can we make it speak to an arbitration panel of people that actually know what they're talking about? Um, or, you know, and, and like Matt was saying, how can we take something super technical about healthcare or about data and kind of put it into lawyer speak so that we can tell our client attorneys and they can then tell their clients, uh, the end client, whether it's a big healthcare payer or a hospital, um, you know, what to do um, based on that analysis that we've done. Um, so then a couple of cases that I want to tell you guys about. Um, right now I'm working on a claims dispute, which is pretty boring. It's a dispute between a payer and provider. Um, so uh, you know, a big health insurance company and, and a hospital. The interesting thing about this case, and the reason I wanted to tell you guys about it, is that our attorney clients on this matter are very out of their depth. Um, so we are spending a lot of time really educating them on healthcare educating them on claims. And the, the interesting thing about it is that we've gotten to walk through the whole dispute process. So the first thing we did is we helped them prepare for their mediation attempt, where they basically get together with the other side and say, can we work this out on our own? Believe it or not, that did not work. <laughs> um, so now we're preparing for arbitration, um, where, you know, so it's, it's not, it's a, another dispute process, uh, resolution process through, you know, there will be an arbitration panel, I think, in this case. Um, and so we're helping write the position papers. Kevin will have his own expert report saying what he believes the, you know, the correct damage number is. Um, and we've been doing those support calculations for that. Um, but really the coolest thing about that project has been real, truly being the subject matter experts because because the attorneys we're working with just don't really understand healthcare, definitely don't understand data, um, and just being able to take that technical, which is not to say all attorneys don't understand data, lots of meetings. Um, it's good for job security. Yeah, yeah. The intersect, honestly, the intersection, the biggest thing about my career is I found the intersection of healthcare and data is just so much opportunity there. Just like take two buzzwords, put them together, and that's what you're doing. Um, yeah, and then the other case I want to tell you guys about, recently I was pulled into the opioid litigation. Um, so this is the litigation where all these municipalities and, um, and state governments are suing opioid manufacturers, um, pharmacies, and some other distributor chains. Um, I can't obviously tell you guys who my client is, but, um, but it's been so interesting to work on something so current. Um, and so, you know, we can talk about, like, I can rattle off all these opioid statistics and, you know, and it actually is something from my job that, that's not so esoteric that I, that I can't talk to people about it at, you know, dinner parties and stuff because we all go to dinner parties. Um, yeah, so those are, I mean, those are the types of cases I wanted to tell you guys about. Um, healthcare is, is huge, obviously, and, you know, growing sector of the economy, so I would encourage anybody to, to get into it. And the really the, the lexicon for healthcare is so it's so specialized that it once you once you know it and once you can use it, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, space that you can take up, especially as a consultant, you know, helping people learn about healthcare and um, and helping attorneys um, present their cases. Um, so We'll get some more stuff when the questions happen. So, thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, Christy. Yeah. 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 Hi, everyone. So not only did you get a double dose of litigation, but now you get a double dose of HR. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I'm very happy to be here tonight. I finished my MBA at DePaul in 2012. Um, definitely, <laughs> um, definitely took a non-traditional route to consulting. So very happy to share with you a little bit about my story. 
Um, I talk a lot. Uh, I talk to a lot of people about career growth and about career transition and about getting hired and how to get hired and how to hire. Um, and one thing that I always keep coming back to is where you are today doesn't really dictate where you can go tomorrow, right? I mean, especially where you all are here in this room, right? You have the common connection of DePaul. You have the ability to make any change in any leap that you want from here. And I am a perfect testament to that belief, which is probably why I hold it so strongly. Um, because when I look back at some of the changes that I made in career, my in my career, my path was definitely weaving in and out, right? So I had um, I went to IU, to Indiana for undergrad. Um, Who's your back there? All right. IU. Oh, okay. Well, that's close enough. I'll take you. Perfect. We'll take any sort of Hoosier we want. That's perfect. Um, and we, first informatics school in the United States. So at IU, that's awesome. Really good. So I majored in finance in undergrad because I thought that's where I could make the most money, and um, realized that I absolutely hated finance. And I'd already gotten early admit to the business school, and I was going to out of state tuition. And my dad was like, "Yeah, you can go to any school." If you want to not be focused on finance, you can come back home and go to Ohio State and do whatever you want there. And um, I really started to like Bloomington and really fell in love with um, a lot of the things and friends that I had there and wanted to stay. So I ended up getting into agency recruiting after that um, for six years, hiring finance and accounting people, and then went on to hire SAP consultants, which is even worse than hiring finance people. Um, and then I came to DePaul. <laughs> so it was during my time at DePaul that I was still trying to figure out my way, like what am I gonna do next? But I remember when I was um, in undergrad, I really was drawn to operations because I loved process. I loved looking at something and trying to make it better. Whether if it was working at a restaurant, doing something at, the, you know, at home, whatever that was, I wanted to make it more efficient, I wanted to make it better, and I wanted to make people see the light of doing things in a more efficient and productive way. Um, so I started focusing on operations here and really focused a lot on um, manufacturing, which wasn't exactly my background. I really drew myself, I was more drawn to professional services. And so I started to focus on leadership and change management. And that's when I started to take a couple econ classes and realized that I actually understood what people were talking about for the first time ever um, in terms of economics. Honestly, like I had taken econ in high school. I definitely took an undergrad and I never really got it until I came to DePaul. And then I when it finally clicked, I like fell in love with it. So um, that combination of business strategy and leadership and change management really laid excellent foundation for a career not only in HR, but also in consulting. Um, so that allowed me to make a switch into corporate HR, where I led um, recruiting for North and South America offices of a market research company and um, re responsible for all hiring, employee engagement, and talent development, and then went on to become a head of HR for a tech company here in Chicago. So none of that was consulting, right? I mean, there was a lot of consulting bits during all those roles, um, you know, convincing someone to leave a job and take a new job, all those things, right? A lot of change management when it comes to HR, but I never really got into true consulting um, until um, when I was at the tech company, we got venture capital investment, um, which is one of the reasons they hired me. They knew we were going to grow really, really quickly, and they knew that HR was a total mess, and they needed someone to build in processes and really make the thing hum. So I was selected to do that, and then they did secure venture capital investment, and I saw all of my executive peers get consulting help. Like we had a finance consultant, a sales consultant, a marketing consultant. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, where's my HR consultant? Where who's going to teach me how to do these things? And um, never really had that opportunity. So I started to make connections with my other HR leadership peers, or leader peers, right? The other folks that were running tech, running HR for tech companies, and started to realize that we were all just kind of making this up. And that's when I got the idea, like, I'm going to be that person. I'm going to be the one that comes into companies 
and helps them get their game together when it comes to HR, right? It's so important. We've heard it all today, like talent is the number one driver, right? Um, and so many companies don't focus their efforts and don't focus their investment where it really matters, which is teaching the people, not only teaching people the right skills, but making sure you have the right people to teach them the right skills. So I spent three and a half years um, doing independent consulting on talent strategy. So when you think about how things like um, economics can play a part in something like recruiting and hiring, um, I can tell you that it all, you know there's a lot of data involved, there's a lot of strategic decision making, and um, a lot of thinking about where the market is around you, right? What are other organizations doing? What is the labor market telling us from a location strategy perspective, from a compensation strategy perspective? So it was during my time um, independently that I focused a lot on uh, recruitment process design, a lot on technology optimization when it comes to how to recruit and retain um, talent, and a lot on employment branding. And then um, I got a call from Vista Equity Partners, which is where I work today. So Vista, I had never heard the name, but apparently they're really fancy and important. Um, number one, tier one private equity firm. Um, software company. What's that? Fourth largest software company. We just became the fifth, actually, because we just sold off one of our. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good stat. That's a good. Yeah, that's really good. I was working for got sold to. Oh, okay. So you're familiar. So hopefully it's a positive experience. Um, it'll be better now, but I left. But it was terrible before. They need the help. They need the help. So Vista as an investment company. So we were started by Robert Smith. Um, for those that don't know that name, they might know his um, legacy. So Robert is a billionaire, um, didn't start that way, um, but he was in the news a lot last year for buying up all of the student loan debt at Morehouse for the 2019 grads. Yeah. So, yay! Um, Robert's awesome. He um, started Vista uh, in 2000. Vista has never had one failed investment in 20 years and our average return is 4x and that is just incredible no other private equity company can say that we invest only in software companies and we buy organizations that are good performers they've got a unique product products that you've heard of we own like some of our business uh, or b2c mark uh, companies are like mind body so if you've ever gone to a yoga class or any sort of fitness class you probably use mind body to book that um, in chicago numerator is part of the vista um, portfolio fusion risk management stats vivid seats a lot of names that you might recognize both from a small company perspective we have organizations from like 50 people all the way up to like 14,000 in our portfolio. We have about 70,000 employees around the globe um, when you think of Vista as an organization. So the one thing that um, besides the software element that all of our organizations have in common is they've got a really good product, but operationally they might have some challenges. So Robert had the bright idea of not only do we want to invest in these companies, but let's help them to get better, let's teach them, let's develop the folks internally um, and bring in all these different subject matter experts to show them the way and to help protect our investment, but also to develop new leaders in that process, right? So one of the things we talk about a lot is leaving a business better than the way that we found it. It's not just about holding a company for three to five years and then getting like a 6x return. That's a big part of it. But um, in the meantime, it's also about developing folks at every single level. So I work in the talent strategy side of the business. Um, so we go into organizations and help them understand a holistic talent philosophy. So a lot of what my panel, our fellow panelists were talking about today um, in terms of diagnosing um, mm -hmm. Diagnosing current state, right, from a talent perspective and understanding where the opportunities are to make things better, to um, to grow and maximize investment, but also to grow and maximize talent, right? Um, Vista is very, very careful and very responsible in the way that we help organizations. Oh my God, 
my time's almost up to grow. Um, so let me tell you with that, um, something that I just got to work on this week. So I was out on the West Coast. This is a company that we've had for many years in the portfolio, big company. And um, they're not doing so well. Um, and we're sort of ready to be like, we've, but we've held on to you for a while now. Like, let's figure out exactly what the, the issue is. Like, why does no one want to buy you? Um, you have a really recognizable and very well-respected product, but something must not be going well, right? So this was our opportunity as a talent team to go in. We sat with their HR team all day long, and we really uncovered from top to bottom. We really focused in this discussion on organizational health. So thinking through not only their compensation structure, but the way that um, you know their their employees are tenured, the way that their employees are leveled, and talk about data. I mean, the whole entire day was like pulling up different data analytic heat maps and looking at um, different charts of like their again employee tenure and what that landscape looked like to really understand. Oh my gosh you know, your organization structure should be pretty lean at the top and grow as it gets to that more entry level. You've got to completely flip. That's why it's so expensive. And that's why you're having such trouble um, hiring and making the right decisions within your company. Um, so all that to say, there's a lot of economics that go into talent. There's a lot of strategic decision making that we as consultants help our organizations, whether it's clients, portfolio companies, or partners um, to come to, and really focusing on creating a better tomorrow for them and creating value within the organization. So happy to answer any questions. Let's give one more round of applause for all of our panelists. Before we dig into some, some questions, um, uh, just a friendly reminder to, to stick around afterwards. Um, our, our panelists will, will be here. Uh, there's some food, uh, and, and it's a great opportunity to, to continue to, to mingle. Uh, with, with that said, uh, anything on anyone's mind? Yeah, good uh, I was wondering what uh, you thought, what, you, what, what are your thoughts on the McKinsey advising ICE on the, on the, the immigrant uh, work gig and uh, how, um, how, can, how those thoughts on their values are different from your company and, uh, and how does the industry approach uh, sales in in, in terms of uh, uh, who are the clients that you use and that you take, uh, what stuff that you guys do? It's an open question for him. So I can't speak directly about McKinsey and that issue in particular, but just in terms of clients, etc., I can tell you that my firm is very careful in terms of the clients we do take on. That there is a process you know, by which you ensure that they are a proper client. Um, uh, I, uh, it, it was not, so you don't get involved in any difficult or tricky issues. That said, as, as an attorney, um, we represent people of, of, and, and represent companies in all different types of situations. So um, I would say it's such the, the, the political dynamics of the situation you raise, that's not something um, we, we uh, uh, typically deal with. Um, but, you know, I think as attorneys in general, um, you know, my wife is uh, uh, it's also an attorney. She does uh, civil legal aid. She represented people on death row previously um, in California. Um, just as attorneys, we're essentially obligated to a certain degree to, um, you know, to represent people of all different backgrounds, all different positions, uh, knowing that everyone deserves a, you know, competent attorney. Um, but that's probably not the most interesting answer that you wanted, so I would defer to my other panelists uh, to comment further. Yeah, maybe yeah, I'll, I'll see it from our side. Uh, like I, I think as an organization, you have to have a sense of true north and, and sense of your own moral compass, not only as a team, but also as, as a partnership, as, as, as individuals, right? So. We try to anchor ourselves in, in leading practices and we, we try to stay as neutral as we possibly can. Uh, you know, as I talked about earlier, objectivity is, is a very important element of why people bring in consultants. Now, I can't speak exactly why they did what they did or whether they did it or to what extent or why it's happening. I can tell you that from our vantage point, we're very, um, 
deliberate to ensure that the clients that we take on are aligned with our organizational strategy and the moral compass. And uh, it's, it's served us well thus far, and, and you know, clearly you know, reputation is our, our most valuable currency, and it's something we continue to, to focus on. Yeah, I guess I would say, I just to, can we yeah, stand up there? Um, I guess I found myself, especially early in my career, thinking to myself, okay, I'm working for white collar criminals right now that have been, you know, they have fraud allegations against them, right? So, you know, as that's, and often defendants are the ones who can pay the expert services bill, so you're often working for defendants, right? And I think, I mean, I think you kind of have to bring it back to, as an independent expert, you can always fall back on, you know, I'm only gonna say what I believe to be true, and I'm only gonna say what the analysis tells me. Um, unfortunately for McKinsey, I guess their analysis, you know, told them to, to give ICE that advice. Um, but I guess, I guess as long as you're, you know, in, in my industry, as long as you're true to, to your objective purpose and being, you know, I've been obtained and I, or I've been retained as an independent expert, um, then, then, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to take every client you don't have to, they can't really force you to say anything that you don't want to say. Yeah, and along those lines in terms of um, feeling good about the work you're doing, right? I mean, when I first started working in private equity, I mean, that's not something that ever spoke to me, right? And I did struggle with that, thinking like, wow, my job exists to make millionaires, multimillionaires, and multimillionaires, billionaires. Like, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. And then I realized that actually my job is to work with my CHRO counterparts get them to be as good as they possibly can be and help them navigate because this is here no matter what right this is going to be there without me and without that person but what we can do is work together to make this the most rewarding experience that it possibly can be so i think speaking to your own ability to affect change whether it's something that's made at a level that you're not even privy to but you're the one that's doing the work um keeping true to yourself and making sure that you're in it for the right reasons is um, always going to be helpful so I'll hand up front and one in the back. Yeah, so I just, I really, it's a question um, directed to you, Matt. You were talking about the economics and as a law firm. Um, okay, what do you think of in terms of, you're talking about cost benefit analysis and expectations. Where does probability come in in terms of whether or not a case is going to be won or lost? It's an excellent question. Okay. Um, it, it's, uh, it's difficult to say, and that's something that lawyers are grappling with more and more. Um, I think if, my experience is if you went back 20, 30 years, essentially those type of analyses were essentially done where you would get a group of senior attorneys who have been practicing for 30 or 40 years. They would go into a room and based on their experience, come up with a judgment of, you know, we expect this case to continue until X. And it's based on their past experience. And yes, it's subjective, a completely subjective probability if you want to sign it in the numerical percentage to it. Um, it's a subjective probability that they, that they come up with. I would say things are a little more advanced now, but but not as as much as might one as one might hope. Um, so in more recent times, in the past probably five years or so, there's been an enormous investment in trying to come up with data analytics that can be used in litigation. So there are companies that have uh, been uh, I think one is, is Lex Predict. It was um, purchased by. I believe Flex Predict was um, uh, uh, purchased by LexisNexis um, incorporated to their whatever large legal services provider, we can do legal research. But there are these companies that now go out and say, and try to put together analytics and say, before Judge X in the Northern District of California, and say, and I trust matters, one, what is the length of time until a motion to dismiss is decided? So there are different stages of litigation, right? You initially, so for those who aren't familiar, you file a claim, then uh, if the plaintiff files a claim, then defendants usually do something called a motion to dismiss where you say it's an improper claim, it should be dismissed, it should be kicked out. If it's not kicked out, then you proceed on to the next stage of the litigation, which is more discovery. If it's a class action, you try to certify a class, which is a class of a bunch of people. But there's all these different stages. And so with some of the information that's out there now is it can give you an idea in the Northern District of California. Why I say Northern District of California because there's a lot of antitrust cases there. Um, and I'm a California licensed attorney as well, so I'm out there quite a bit. 
that there are um, a there's there's data where they're trying to track now for this particular judge, this particular type of case, how long will it last? On this particular case, how often does this judge actually grant a motion to dismiss? Then to litigation, how often does a judge deny or grant class certification? Now, at the end of the day, um, you know, I love that. That's more data. That's wonderful, um, and it's something that we try to use in our analyses and to incorporate. At the same time, uh, my personal belief, and this is just this is just me speaking, is you have to be careful using those numbers because those numbers are very helpful and they can be a check. Um, at the same time, you do want experienced attorneys who have practiced before that judge, et cetera, because not every case is the same. Right. And so, um, you know, it's probably not as far as every lawyer wants you to say, think that every single case is uniquely independent at, at, at all, but when you're looking at one particular matter, um, it's, 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 it can be a little more difficult. But, you know, something else too that we just know in terms of probabilities, which you're also seeing more recently in the litigation spaces, litigation planning. Um, and litigation financing where you have external funders who are coming in to finance litigation. And so if you have particularly a company who wants to pursue a claim, uh, say someone is doing an antitrust violation trying to drive them out of the market, they no longer have the capital to pay high legal bills to sue the large corporation, the multi-billion dollar corporation do that, and you can potentially get a litigation funder to come in, which is an external investment group that comes in and tries to put in money into the case and actually tries to then, you know, to buttress your claim. Now, in their case, they're not, they're evaluating one case in particular, but they have a portfolio, right? So portfolios, so when you're looking at a course over a portfolio of different matters or for a particular client, right, as we start to look at things in the aggregate, things then do tend to behave a little bit better than trying to assume one. one. So to come back and then hope that I didn't with too, inform, too much information, I would say is, they're looking at one individualized matter, you have some information that's available publicly. It's an increasing uh, service that's trying to be offered. Uh, but I would say you need to check that against client the attorney experience to, as a reality check on whether that information can be useful. I would say in the aggregate, if you're talking about representing a one particular client in a multitude of different claims, and we're talking hundreds of claims of, of similar nature, then you can start talking about probabilities, and you could say based on past experience of similar claims, I expect X percent to settle. You know, uh, uh, one minus X percent. Uh, you know, obviously not to continue on to, to trial and for what the claims are, and then you can start doing something more sophisticated. Um, but definitely, law is trying, and I would, I would say it's behind the curve. It is trying to get more analytical and trying to say what is that probability. But there's still not a perfect approach. Yeah, can I just do a piggyback off of that because I think it's really interesting. What I would encourage, actually, more. Would you be able to stay around a little, a little bit, that Sure. So, so I, I do see a, a number of other oh, okay. topics, but right, if, if we do have time, but if not, perfect okay. opportunity afterwards to so, take his break. I saw him in the, in the back. Uh, yeah, my question's for uh, Smell and Mira. Um, I really enjoyed the frameworks that you shared in particular, the, um, what does a high performer look like? And I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit more about that and kind of the idea of what the three pillars would be, you know, starting with the technical, is it that you really kind of lean into a specific strength and then evolve that and then kind of figure out what are your strengths and weaknesses in the other and build on those, or just kind of how you would recommend starting to think about that if you're leaning into either a shifting career. Yeah, so uh, maybe a good way to look at it is, let's say it's, it's a it's a 12 month program that, that somebody's going through, right? Uh, it's 30% standard, 70% tailored to that specific individual. So that 30% means that every single person will go through the same set of exercises call it a uh, current state evaluation, which we've talked about through the three plus four, which is the pyramid of the box, right? And where are you today and where do you want to go tomorrow, right? So that's more interview form. Um, set of psychometric based assessments to sort of understand what are some of your blind spots and why do you do what you do and kind of utilize that to enhance the, the interview side, right? And then the last piece is within the 30% is focused on your leadership brand. So, so the premise is, whether we want to admit it or not, every single one of us in this room has a leadership brand. The question is, is it the right one? All right. So when you're not in the room, what do people say about you? And are you okay with that? And if so, that's great. If not, how do we begin to kind of move that towards you know defining it proactively, positioning it, curating it? So that's the, the 30%, right? Um, the 70% is as an output of that intake exercise. Uh, you may have individuals that, that are very good on the people side, but they may struggle on the technical side. It's typically vice versa. 
right? So, so the people side is typically the most difficult because you can't really quantify it. It's, it's such a feeling, <laughs> right? It's uh, difficult to predict, right? We're you know emotional creatures, right? So it, it's really about utilizing the 30% to understand where the person needs to focus and then building a deliberate plan to touch on every single one of the pillars, okay? Now, um, if you're in industry versus consulting, we may have to prioritize certain elements. If you are uh, transitioning out of industry into consulting, we'll likely prioritize, I don't know, let's say your immersion plan, making sure that you're setting effective expectations, that you're building client relationships, that uh, you're hitting your numbers in terms of your sales, your uh, new product lines that you're bringing, uh, cross-functional partnerships, right? So it just depends on the profession, but at the end of the day, um, it is that 3070 that, that allows us to, you know, be standardized, but still be very specific to an individual's needs. I think the importance of specifically the technical portion that you mentioned really varies on where you are in your career, right? So more entry level, some org- and it depends on where you go, right? So some organizations really don't care how much you know on the technical side, they'll teach you, teach you and they'll train you and you'll go through a training program, whereas you know, the, the higher up you go, the further you are in your career, it will be expected that you already have that knowledge, right? So I just add that component on career and company. Thank you. Yes. Uh, this question was inspired by Amir at Sinel, but I think anyone could answer it. Uh, you use the language uh, sustaining the transformation in the organization after you leave, because uh, the goal, I guess, is to leave eventually. Uh, what are some of the strategies or tips that you have to make sure that what you have brought to your client sticks once you're done? Yeah, so um, we look at it in terms of three pillars, there are those pillars, right? Four pillars. Uh, the, the first one is typically uh, defining the business case, number one. So defining the business case, why are we driving the change? Why is it important? Quantitative, right? Dollars behind it and qualitative on you know, the emotional side, right? Uh, once we have that defined, then it's getting into board engagement. And that's really where um, we introduce different mechanisms, whether it's mass communication, whether it's um, you know engaging the influencers, turning them over into the new way of working, right? And then the third stage is adoption. That's really where you, where you put in metrics, right? So our baseline was engagement scores of 45%. Tomorrow we expect it to be 75%. So we're really setting targets, not only for ourselves, but for the team that steps in after we're gone. So the handoff is taking place throughout the course of each one of these three phases. So we're engaging their internal resources, we're developing them, we're teaching them tools, the frameworks. And so then our job becomes to really step back and, and operate as a trusted advisor. So instead of you know being on site for 45 hours a week, right? It's let's connect every quarter. Let's talk about our game plan. Let's talk about what's going well. What do we need to improve? What do we need to stop doing? What other support do you need, right? Eventually we'll quote unquote go away, right? That's that's the the ultimate idea. But as you know, the people side of the equation is likely the most complex, and there's always going to be work, but it needs to be driven by by the client team. And the other thing I'll add is um, alignment with the senior leadership team, starting with the CEO, right? So sometimes um, for HR specifically, it's extremely hard to sell their vision of what they really see happening in the organization internally. And so senior leaders tend to be more open-minded to hearing it from an objective third party. And so before we leave, so one, train HR and other influencers, but to ensure that this is priority at the senior level, that it's part of their strategic plan, that there's budget and money behind it, that there are resources, people, time, not just time of the people doing the training, but that every other person is going to be allowed to go to training, right? How, I mean, if you've been part of organizations frequently, it's the first thing to get canceled because it's at a quarter, uh, for finance, it's the beginning of the quarter or accounting, right? There's always an issue. And so how do you make a priority at the top before you exit the organization? Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, sure. Um, so from my short stint in operations consulting, um, 
I, before I went to FCI and started working kind of on the ground and more operational stuff, I thought I thought that why what is change management? Why do you need it? Right? And I think I think probably a lot of us think, you know, you if you want to change an organization, you can just go in and here's the new policy. But but if you guys have had you know in your in your careers, you've seen that. When, when a consultant comes in, everyone is very resistant to the ideas that they have to offer because they are the outsider. And um, this is the way that we do it here, and I don't really care what you're saying. So if you don't get that buy-in from the leader, and, and like you guys were saying earlier, the leadership, everything that, that they say, if they say, oh, we have to go to the stupid training now, then everyone below that person is gonna believe it's a stupid training. Um, <laughs> And in, I was I was building apps for a hospital in the operations consulting that we were doing. And when I went into, we went in to work with a specific team. Um, and I remember we presented a proof of concept to them and we said, this is what we think your app can look like. And the the leader of the team said, I, I don't understand this. I don't, I think this is a terrible app. And so we said, okay, well, we're gonna get your feedback. And we had meetings every two weeks and designed, the, designed an app for their team from the ground up. And at the end, I will tell you, the app looked almost identical to the proof of concept <laughs> that we gave them in the beginning, but it's so important to go in and take these people by the hand and bring them along the journey, right? So all of the change management, getting people to use the tools and adopt them comes with getting their feedback and making them really feel a part of it as you're building it. Right. Yeah, completely agree. And you know, in my experience, working hand in hand from the very beginning, um, with those key decision makers, with those key leaders, only adds to your advantage to get that decision to stick, right? From you know a due diligence perspective, is this the right investment in the first place? To, okay, now we have the investment, now let's go in and do a really deep dive in each of the functional areas and under and really uncover, you know, there's no hiding now, like now you're part of, um, you know, our portfolio, so let's really go through exactly what exists and what doesn't exist. And then let's put together that value creation plan. And that's something that's done hand in hand with the leaders. And then it's about deciding, okay, now that we've now that we've uncovered what's needed to be done, what are you comfortable taking on yourself versus what you need our support on versus what do we work together on versus what do you need us to do entirely? So working very closely together in the initial stages to not only map that out, but really determine the needs and then come to an agreement on execution. Um, it's then backing it up and you know the touch points to the earlier points may get less and less over time, but making sure those touch points still happen. So um, a lot of it's not just, you know, you, of course you want to make a relationship and say, hey, how are things going? Things still working well, but data doesn't lie, right? So making sure that you have those data points that you can point to and you put those fail safes in place. Fail safes not to say that if it's here, it won't fail. It's that if it's here, we can measure it and then we can measure it against what the plan intended. Um, and that way, as new potential leaders come in or the organization grows, you have something that you're already able to plug into and continue to, um, to watch happen well. Let's give our panelists one more hand. <laughs> and thank you again so much for joining us.